So we are talking about having a review session uh, during the study break, and if everything goes okay and we have the session, this is how you get into a uh, big blue button. So you log in to, uh, to Seneca, then uh, logging in from Seneca, you log in to my Seneca, select your subject, that is OP244NAB, just click on the subject, and uh, go in Tools, and at right side you see Big Blue Button. Click on Big Blue Button, and click on Launch. Now, this is mine because I'm the admin. You won't see this, so I'm going to say, I'm going to say over here, uh, study, break, uh, review session, okay? Uh, description, welcome message. Uh, I'm going to write, please use headsets or whatever. Please use headsets and mute right away when you log in. Yeah, when you log in, the microphone is on. Mute yourself, because we don't want to hear you chewing gum and <laughs> doing like that, okay? Mute yourself when you want to talk, unmute yourself, okay? Um, users, no students must wait until yada yada. A session in this room may be recorded. Now I'm going to say save. So what you see will be this, okay? And you simply click on join session, and the session begins. Okay, and as you see, it just started. Uh, don't ever come in at listen only. I hate that. Okay, I want microphone. I want to be able to hear you. Okay, and when you do log in uh, with a microphone, then it's going to be an echo test. One, two, one, two, three. Let me see if it's here. One, two. If you hear this, it means you're okay. Then you click on yes. Echo comes back in. And now we are in session. Now, if anybody logs in, you will see that you're going to see me with here with the slides and everything. So you're going to see the slides. I can share my screen. I can share uh, my video. And there you go. Where is it? Oh, it's closed. Voila. OK. So you can, uh, yeah. Of course. What do you mean by anybody? Oh, for, um, I asked for it. Um, they didn't let us. It is only for lectures, sadly. Only I can start it. And by the way, use this with pride. Students at Seneca College has lots of code in this program. Um, I have, I had, it was actually my project, and we had many students of ours have lots of code in this thing. So use it with pride. This is uh, one of the things that Seneca uh, uh, contributed a lot. Anyway, so I'm going to log off. Log out, okay, and it goes out. So, uh, but you can always go to demo at bigbluebutton.org and open a session and invite other people to get in and you'll be okay. If you have any friends who want to log in, you have to let me know, I have to send them a link. I, people can only come in through their session, okay? I can have guests, but if, if anybody wants to log, come in, you have to let me know so I can send them a, a link. So, shall we uh, start our uh, session? Any more questions? So, last time, to demonstrate all the things we have done, I created a string, and I went through it, and we did uh, whatever we did with, uh, uh, with the class string. So, it's the class string, actually, what it did, it, uh, we planned it so it can replace the string that we have, the, the, the C string that we have with null termination and stuff, we don't want to be worried about it. So we created this so we can actually do our, make all the dirty work behind the scene in our object so we don't have to worry about it anymore. Anytime I want to have a name, I don't have to size it properly and do everything so this sizes itself uh, automatically to whatever the user enters. So it's a, um, a pretty cool thing. The string of mine has a no argument uh, default constructor. 
we had a constructor, one argument constructor that accepts a C style string and creates my string, dynamically allocates memory for the, to the size of that one. So let's actually take a look at it. I'm going to split the window. First, let me open the second one. So I'm going to open uh, string.cpp, split the two. So I can actually see what I'm doing in here. Um, so for this constructor, if I right click and go to definition, it's going to show it to me. So as you see, I am setting the, the string to empty, which means it, it, sets, every, it sets the null, uh, uh, the, the data pointer uh, to null and the size to zero. And uh, I'm checking to see if any string is provided to me, which this essentially means uh, as if I'm saying if str is not equal to null ptr. But because we know, but because we know null means false and anything other than zero null means true, I don't need to write not equal to null pointer. It's redundant. Therefore, I'm saying if string is not null, then set my object to string. How do I set it? First, I free the memory. Free memory over here in a constructor is a dummy thing to do because there is no memory to free. It is a brand new object that I'm creating. It's the constructor. But because I want to reuse my code, it doesn't matter if it's called. Free memory, essentially what it does, and to see what it does, right click over it and go to go to definition. If I look at free memory, it deletes the data because the data is set to null using set empty. Nothing's going to happen. And then it sets it. So as you see, it sets the object to empty over here, right? So it would have been nice to reuse the code. So I'm going to say over here, sit empty. I'm not going to uh, write the code that is getting a recall. So it deletes the data uh, and sets the object to empty. But because set empty was called before that, that delete data won't do anything. So essentially, free memory, when set is called in a constructor, will not do anything. After free memory, it measures the size of data that I want to actually set and keeps it in the size of the object. So the size of the object will be set to the length of the data. Because this is a C style string, I'm adding one to it. If it was an integer array, I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't add one to it. But because the standard functions for C to work with a null terminated array of characters require an extra null to be attached at the end of data, I have to make the size of my screen one bigger. That's 90% of you guys crashing your programs, not adding that plus one over there. Okay? And so, uh, so I add one to the size and I allocate enough memory for the data. Then I copy all the data from the string into mData using string copy. So now my string has <clears throat> a copy of what was sent in dynamically exactly to the size that it wants, and it can keep track of the size too, and it's created. And that was the uh, single argument constructor. For the copy constructor, <clears throat> why do we create copy constructor? Because we know that when objects in C language, C++ language, uh, talking about it last uh, session, every time you pass a value by, uh, you pass an object by value, at any moment that you pass an object by value to a function, or you pass an object by value through a return statement, C++ creates a copy out of it. And creation of copy will cause a crash. Because of that fact, we have to take over the action of copying so copying won't crash our program. How does copy crash or copying crash our programs? This is how it does it. If we do not allocate memory, this is how problems happen. So essentially, you have two classes. Um, not that one. 
No, that one, not that one. Sorry, wrong slide. This is the one, I think. I'm going to go for good copying, and then I'm going to tell you what's going to happen if it's bad. So, whenever you are passing a data by value, a copy constructor is called, which the case is this. So, if I just copy everything directly from one to another, if I just copy everything from one to another, which means if I, if I just get the content of A and put it in B, then A and P are, B are going to point to the same place. So they are going to share the data. And because of that fact, when they are both getting deallocated, they try to deallocate the same memory twice. And that causes a crash at exit. So if your program runs perfectly, but right at the end, when program ends, it gives you a segmentation fault, usually that is the case. Because of this fact, when I actually copy something, when I have a class, then the second class is copying, as you see, like this. As you see, it copies like this. Or I, I assign at the moment of creation that is a constructor again. This is what I have to do. First, I have to measure the size of the other object. So essentially, I have to say, get the size of that one, and allocate enough memory, keep the address in the new one, then one by one copy everything from the old, the old one to the new one. In this case, I'm not having a string, so I don't have that plus one at the end. It's just an array of data. And then after everything got copied to the new one, I, I bring, that, bring out the new size. And then after that, I have two objects that are copy of each other. When one goes out of scope, the destructor will delete that data, and the object goes out of scope, no problem. And when the second object goes out of scope, the destructor deletes that data, and life is beautiful, and therefore we have no memory leak. But when we do have memory leak, the problem is that when we do bad copying, what happens is that What happens is that everything one by one will get copied, but no copying will happen really. Therefore, two objects will point to the same place. This memory leak that you see will not happen in case of copying. This is assignment, as you see. This is not copying, which means object B already existed with its own, with its own memory. In copying, you create a new object right at the moment of creation, you need to copy the data. So therefore, this one doesn't have any type of properties. So this memory leak will not happen in copy copying. But when the object goes out, out of scope, then the, the second one remains without any value. And when the second one goes, that's when the structure crashes. And that's what we actually have a, a problem with. So, to prevent that problem, we do the copying the way I mentioned it to you. So we actually say set empty. We do it exactly like a regular constructor, but instead of bringing the data in, we use the other object's data to do whatever we are doing. So as you see, it works the exact same way. The only difference is that it copies the data of another object and therefore becomes a copy of that object, and that's how my string works. And I have to make sure that when the object goes out of uh, uh, scope and it gets destroyed, the memory I requested for it manually actually gets destroyed, and that's what you see over here. I free the memory. Lots of people, after freeing the memory, they actually set the object to empty, okay, as a habit. As a habit, it's good. Yes, whenever you deallocate memory, you have to set the pointers to null. That's the rule that we have to follow not to have memory leak. But when we, but putting it over there, setting it free after that, it just doesn't make sense. The reason is that, again, when you want to throw something away, you don't need to wash it up. Okay, the object is dying, so you don't need to clean it up after. But at any other time, you should. 
The set function, we have seen what it is. The print simply prints it out. Uh, the is empty tells us if it's empty or not, so essentially it tells us if the data is null or the size is zero. If any of these two, it means my object is empty and it has nothing. Um, int size tells me what is the size safely with a const, so therefore this is the problem that you might have over here, my friend, that you said that uh, I couldn't call the function. Any function that you're calling, uh, you got to make sure that that function follows its logic. My uh, size is supposed to tell me what is the size of the object. It is not supposed to change the object. Therefore, I need to have uh, that mentioned in my code telling that it's a constant value and it won't delete it. It, it won't uh, modify it. And the same thing with is empty. But, for example, set cannot be constant because it actually changes the object. All right? And uh, then we talked about operators. We said when we are dealing with operators, operators are essentially functions that we simply uh, uh, give it an operator name. That's what we call uh, an operator overload. So creating an operator overload, we mentioned, happens in a uh, few different ways. So, as I mentioned, when I create an operator, an operator can be in two different ways. Either an operator can be set as a binary operator, which means it has two operands, A and B. And we said if that's the case, 90% of the situation, this operator is a member of the left object. So essentially, this operator's implementation is A dot, sorry, operator call is a dot operator, whatever the operator is, and it accepts a b. So this is the operator call. This is the operator call using its function notation. And we mentioned whenever you see an a plus b as a binary, you have to always investigate. If the class uh, that made a say it's foo, so I have foo a, and the class b is, let's say, fa, I have fa b. If that's the case, the signature of this operator usually is something like foo, because a is of type foo, scope resolution, operator, whatever it is, and it accepts a fa as Argument. Now, this far, we don't know. It could be a constant one. It could be a reference one. I don't know. What type of a return type it has, type of return type, is unknown. I don't know. But this is something that I could be almost sure about. So if the operator is a member, that's how it's going to happen. So. If I take a look at my source code over here, let me see what do I have as my source code. So if I want to compare two strings, so I have S and T, and I want to see which one is coming first in the, in, uh, the dictionary, I have to say if S is greater than T, then, else, okay? So, and then I can actually see. So, whatever in here. So, by what I just mentioned here, by what I just mentioned here, that I actually said when you write, uh, oh, oh, sorry. There you go, that's better. So, with what I wrote over there, by knowing that A plus, like A operator B, if foo over here is a class of A, then operator is foo, a scope, resolution, whatever. If I go back over here, I'll see that S 
is a string, so S over here should be the owner of the greater than operator, and that's what it is over here. And if I look at the implementation of it, it's going to be almost the same, which means I'm going to have a string scope resolution operator greater, and at right side, it accepts another string. In this case, it's going to be a constant reference because we never pass objects by value until, unless we have to. We remember from IPC 144, we only pass objects by pointers when it was ob IPC 144, constant pointers. And he, in here, we are saying it's either reference or pointer, which in this case is the reference. This operator greater than is supposed to tell me if one object compared to the object uh, is first or second or bigger or smaller. And I've used the string header files SDR compare. And I'm going to say if data of mine as a first argument and the data of the other as the second argument pass to string compare returns value greater than zero, then that's my result's going to be true. So therefore, using that, now I can actually I'm going to say C out. Um, uh, C out. True. C out. False. And running this application, uh, this program. I got errors. Oopsie. Okay, what are my errors? I should have compiled it before I ran it. Let me let me pause it. This calls the constructor with one argument. Assignment at the moment of creation is a constructor. So it goes to the constructor, calls the constructor. SDR becomes high, sets the object to empty. SDR is not null. Therefore, it comes and sets the object to the value. How does it set it? It first frees the memory. Well, because it's a class that is just created, there is nothing to delete. It's null. So it's not going to do anything. Comes out, gets the length of data that is high and puts it in size. So size becomes 2. Allocates 3 bytes of memory that is the exact same size that I want and puts the address in M data. Now copies everything from high to from data into the data of the object and therefore the object is now pointing to uh, high. So if I look at S, you'll see that S has high and the size is 2. The exact same thing happens with hello. So if I look at T now, you will see that T has hello with a space at the beginning and 6 as size. Now it says, is S greater than T? So it comes over here and sets the result as false. It says if, it's n if neither of these two are empty, okay, then come over here and do the comparison. Actually, if they are both empty, then it should be equal, aren't they? See, we have a bug over here, but it's okay. But anyways, so res uh, uh, is false. Now it does a string compare between m data high and this one hello with the space at the beginning and the result will be true, which means high is greater. It comes next in, in dictionary. Okay, whichever is smaller, that comes first, right? And returns that one, so therefore, true is called, okay? So, it is, so it, the first part of the if statement happens. So essentially, as you see, I can define very uh, operators to deal with my string as if it's regular object, okay? And the same thing happens uh, with the rest of this stuff. So assignment operator is another uh, important thing uh, for you when you are actually uh, 
designing a class uh, with dynamic memory allocation. So there are two uh, things that you have to always implement if you have if you have a class with dynamic memory allocation. Two things. Number one, copy constructor to make sure everything is copied properly with no leakage, which is this one. The second thing that is a must, let me actually bring it down, is the assignment operator. So when two objects, so when two objects are being set to each other or being copied from each other, they won't crash. And therefore, your, program, your class will work properly. These are two important things. If you have dynamic memory allocation, I want you to listen to me carefully, OK? Attention here. This is new thing. You don't know. It was reviewed down to this point. This is a new concept. If you create a class with dynamic memory allocation, and you know that this class is never supposed to get copied or assigned to another class. Like C out. C out is an object, right? I should not be able to copy C out because C out is my console. You can't have two consoles at the same time. It's a unique thing. If you have a class that has dynamic memory allocation and you want to enforce the class not to get copied, or assigned to another class, this is what you can do. So if I wanted my string not to get copied, this is what I have to do. You have to write the signature for the assignment and the copy constructor. Oh, what did I do? Just a second. But in front of it, you have to write equal to delete. This means I am doing dynamic memory allocation. And I know that this thing is not going to get copied. If anybody ever wanted to copy this, prevent it. Don't let it do it. So now I'm going to come over here and comment these two because they don't make sense. I just deleted them, right? So let me comment them, OK? Now, you see in here I'm passing s to print, and it's being passed by value. So it has to get copied, right? Now take a look. If I actually compile it, it's going to tell me. I, where is it? Uh, attempting to reference a deleted function. You see that? So it literally prevents you to copy the object. OK? And that's something that you need to know. So if you wanted to prevent copy or assignment, and therefore a memory leakage, because your object is not, it's, a, it's a unique thing and it's not supposed to get copied, that's how you prevent it. Let me bring it back. I don't want to prevent this. We are, we are copying the thing all the time, so I'm going to let it be. And, but I'm going to put it over here just for you to know. So let me just copy and paste. So I'm going to say do the following to prevent copying an assignment. OK? So if you wanted to make sure that your object cannot get copied, this is what you have to do. Are we OK? Are we OK? All right. OK. No, it doesn't deallocate. It says this function is not supposed to be used. Now, if you look at old, if you look at old C++ programs, that delete is relatively new thing. If you look at old C++ programs, 
to prevent the same thing, what they did, they created empty copy constructors and operator assignment functions, and they put it in the private section of the object. Because there were no delete, they put it in private section. When it's private, it means no one can call it, right? If you can't call it, you can't copy it. So that used to be the old way. So you may see implementations like that, OK? That you see there is an empty assignment, and it's an empty copy constructor, and the prototype is in the private part. Why they did that? Because they didn't want you to copy it. So keep that in mind, too. Any questions down to here? All right, I have an error here. What, oh. All right, uh, so just to understand what's happening over here, A, B, C, D, E, F, if I run this program, It is false because ABC is not greater. W greater means comes after in dictionary. Okay? Anything that comes first in dictionary is smaller than the other one. Just to understand what is true and false over here. The next thing we have done over here was to concatenate one string to another, add one to the end of the other one. And if I wanted to do that, I have to make sure that I understand how a memory is resized. So essentially, resizing a memory is to do something like this. To resize the memory, you have the old value that is pointing to a piece of memory. Then you see what is the new size that you want to actually take care of. How much, like it could be bigger or smaller. So I want to, in this case, I'm making it bigger. So what you do, you allocate in a temporary pointer of the same type the amount of required memory that you have. Then you copy everything from the old one to the new one. So now you have a copy of what you had. If you are shrinking the memory, then you're going to truncate, uh, sorry, you're going to uh, 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 crop the thing and sh cut it short. So half of the data will be copied. There is no other way. If you're shrinking it, that's what's going to happen. In this case, I'm making it bigger. And then after that, after everything is copied, you delete the old data. Because now you have the new one, so there is no, there is no need for the old data. You have a copy of it. After the copying is done, what you do, uh, uh, you make sure that the size that you have is updated to the new size. So it was 7, now you're making it 14. And you make sure that the, old, that the main pointer that is supposed to point the data points to newly allocated memory, and therefore you're going to have a new size. Okay? That's exactly what we have done in here when we wanted to do plus equal. So if you look at the logic for plus equal, Again, if I want to see where the function is, right click over it and say go to definition. It brings you the definition of, oh, sorry, I put it in the wrong one. Uh, where is it? All right. So what I did first, if I am adding one string after another one, I have to get the size of both and add one for null termination. And that's my temp memory. Then I copy the old data from the first one to the beginning of the data. And the rest I concatenate after. Now that all the data is copied in the newly allocated memory, I delete the old one. I'll make sure that my main data pointer points where the newly allocated memory is. I update the size, and I'm done. And like this, I can actually concatenate value. So I can actually say over here s plus equal t. And if I print s now, it's going to be a, b, c, d, e, f. So essentially, it's going to uh, concatenate both of them in a uh, new piece of string. All right?
Uh, assignment operator, we've already uh, talked about it. We went through it, so walk through it to see how it's done. Um, and uh, we talked about friends. We said that uh, when you, uh, sometimes you need to write helper functions. When you're writing a helper function, helper functions are those that actually uh, uh, help you do something with a function that you cannot do it with a member function. Helper functions are standalone functions, but if we want the helper functions to have access to the properties of the class, we can make that helper function a friend, which I mentioned it's a very bad thing to do. You have to do the friends only if you absolutely have to do it and there is no other way. In my experience, whenever you are making something a friend, it's just because you're lazy. You can simply create a method that properly accesses the data that that function needs, and therefore you don't need to create a function of friend. But for learning purposes, we're going to ask you to do it. So you're going to do it because you are trying to learn the syntax. You are not supposed to really do it. Uh, and we created a function called add to. So essentially, add to is doing what plus equal is doing, but in an awful way. And uh, uh, we made that uh, add to a friend of a function. So it's essentially the same thing. If you look at add to, it is doing exactly what the other one does. But because we want it to have access to the string, that's what we have done. And that's what we call a helper function. And now you're going to go for a break and come back and we're going to finalize operator over overload, OK? Break. For this one, I want to give you the example in a very simple class with uh, overloading examples. And then we're going to talk about uh, um, the helper functions that um, can do uh, more, OK? So um, this is a class that encapsulates an integer. Why? Because I want to have an integer that works better than regular integer that, they, that we have. We could do that. We could actually set over here limits for it to make sure when we are reading, it actually reads it, reads it within limits. And we can do lots of good stuff with an integer that you always wanted to do, and you can't do it with, do it with a primitive integer. OK? So if you want to do that, you can actually create a class called int. So as you see, it has a constructor called uh, uh, for, for value, so I can essentially say over here uh, int. Uh, I can say int i set to 10, and this will actually call this constructor and pass 10 to the value, and 10 will be passed to set, and set will make the value 10. Then I can say over here c out uh, i dot get, and this is going to show me what I have uh, in the eye, OK? So if I actually run this program step by step, oh, it went to what? Stop. Sorry. Pause. So I have, see, I have errors, uh, and I had three lines of code, and I had errors. What is expected? This after that, what does it say? There we go. I have a semicolon mistake over there. There we go. Int get. It's supposed to be a const. So I have forgot to put const over there. And let's run it one more time. Oh. And I forget I'm passing an integer for some unknown reason. When you do something in rush, this is what happens. OK. All right. It's just uh, muscle memory. <laughs> All right, one more time. Hopefully, third time's the charm. There you go. So assignment at the moment of creation is a constructor. So it goes to the constructor, passes the 10, sets the value to 10 comes out, get comes over here, returns the 10, and 10 is printed, and we have 10 over here. Right? Simple as that. 
Now, I don't like it. I want to be able to do this. Like a regular integer. I want to be able to say C out I and print the I. OK? How can I do that? How can I actually read the I like that? OK? I have to identify what kind of operator overload I need over here. Now, the operator overload I have over here, first of all, I know what is the name of the operator. It's the insertion operator or left shift operator. So the name of the operator is operator like that. So that's the name of the operator that I have to overload. There is no question about that. But what is the left operand? The left operand is, let me make it bigger so we kind of focus on it. What is the left operand here? It's C out, correct? C out is an instance of which class? I stream or O stream. Output, right? O stream. Now, do I have access to O stream class to go add a function to it? No. Because I don't have access to that function, to that uh, class, I have to write a helper function. There is no other way. Therefore, I'm going to write an operator overload that is not a member. And the signature of a non-member operator overload works like this. It accepts two operands. Left one is an instance of this. So C out is O string. So I'm going to write O string. And to make sure I'm not changing anything, I'm going to make it a reference. Let's call it OSTR. And the right operand is I. What is I? I is of type int, correct? So I'm going to make the right one I. So it's going to be int right operand, let's call it. Now, this int right operand, first of all, we know that we never, ever pass a class by value. So I'm going to make it a reference. That's number one. Number two, am I changing this in any way? I'm not changing it. It has to be constant. I'm just printing it, right? It has to be constant. And what does it return? What does this up? So when this action is done, when this blue part is done, what should be left behind? Integer, right? You're saying integer. If it's an integer, let's say 4. 4 and L, does it make sense anything? No, so it can't be an integer. What should be at left side? So when that operator is done, what should be left behind so the end else should get continue to get printed? Huh? No. If you want to just go to new line, what do you write? No, no. Give me a statement with a semicolon in C++, just printing a new line. What does it do? It's end L. But how do you write that end L? Seriously? OK, this is your quiz. Write a statement in this main that goes to new line only. So what do I write in here? I write C out and L, correct? That goes to new line, right? Now let's go back. Now, when this is done, what should be left behind for that end L to happen? C out. It should return a C out. What is the type of C out? O stream. So operator should return an O stream. So the chain reaction of, of printing can continue. And we always return a reference. It has to return the O stream. Which O stream? The one that it received. <laughs> so it's as easy as that. Return OSDR, and we are done. Now, in here, I have to somehow print this right operand. If I do that, good job. I'm done.
So how do I do that? In here, first of all, OSDR is a new name for C out in there, right? Because it's the C. So C out goes to OSDR. OSDR is C out. Therefore, in here, I should be able to say OSDR RO dot get. Right? Because get is receiving the output out, correct? And that's it. And because I made it a constant, there is absolutely no problem. It will call. If I did not make it a constant, I would be in trouble. Then it would tell me, hey, what are you doing? You are trying to call a, so it's, it's literally it's got to have the object has qualifiers that are not compatible with member function, yada, yada, yada. It, this type is constant. You cannot call a non-constant. That's why I'm saying whenever you are programming, look at your logic. If your logic says I'm not modifying, make it a constant always. So now if I do this, it is still calling the get, the, the uh, RO get thingy. So behind the scene is doing what we have done, but somebody looks at this and it's beautiful. I'm saying int i is equal to 10, c out i, done. All right? Any problem? Okay. But this is not the standard way of printing it. When you are, this was just showing you how to create a helper function. That's a helper function. And it's a beautiful one because it's not a friend. In here, I'm using a getter to get the value out. But what if in here, I had three things that I had to print? Add names and stuff like that. And I had to left justify, right? Do stuff like, if I want to do something like that, how do I do it? The best way to do something like this, and this is a standard thing that you need to learn to do, always have a print function for a class that you want to print with C out. And this function should have the signature that I tell you. Memorize this for now. You don't need to understand it perfectly. Memorize it. The function, call it something that makes sense. So don't call this one hee -haw. Type it, call it print, because the job is print. Print, write, anything that implies that this function Prints this object. So I'm going to say print. Make sure this object returns O stream. And make sure this function receives an O stream reference. And default the value of that to C out. Which means if somebody just calls print, by default it's going to put C out for it. So they could choose to print the class with just the print method instead of putting it in C out. OK? So that's something that you need to memorize. OK? Print receives an O stream, returns an O stream, and defaults the O stream to C out. And then implement it. So you literally say O stream. Print O stream OSDR and it belongs to int, correct? Now use the OSDR to print whatever you want to print. So I want to print the value, right? So I'm going to say OSDR va M value. I'm printing M value, right? And after OSDR is returned, I'm just going to return it out. That works perfectly, right? It first prints it and then returns the OSDR out. So it receives the OSDR, prints it, and then sends it out. Now put this function in your helper and pass the C out through it, which means in here, instead of writing get, instead of writing these two lines, Oh, see, I made a huge boo-boo. What's my mistake here?
I just preached it to you, and I did not do it myself. I said, pardon me? Huh? The constant. I say, look at your logic. If your function is not supposed to change your object, make it a constant. And I didn't do it myself. Bad boy I am. It's printing, right? It's not reading anything. So what I'm going to do over here is this. I'm going to say, OK, this is a constant. Thank you very much. And this is a constant. Thank you very much. And now I can call this in my operator overload. Now I can simply say return RO dot print and pass the OSDR to it. So your C out passes through your print statement. And that's very important. I cannot explain to you why. Trust me on this. It is very important for the OSDR to pass through your uh, print statement. Later on at the end of the semester, you're going to say, wow, OK, now I know why. OK, but for now, memorize this. Now, using this memorization, I can literally do C in 2, make it to be readable by C in. It's the exact same thing. I simply say, I stream reference. Of course, I'm not going to call it print. I'm going to call it read. I stream ISTR sets to C in. Of course, this is not a constant function. It is changing the value of my class. All I need to do is to implement that. So I'm going to say I stream reference int read I stream ISTR, and I'm going to read, use iStream as if it is C in. So what I'm going to say is ISTR read into M value and just return it. Now if I go back in here, I can literally copy this because I'm lazy. Paste it. It's the exact same thing. I stream operator. This one is uh, right shift. Again, I stream ISDR. It is not a constant and it is the reference. So now in here, I'm going to say RO read and I'm going to pass ISDR to it. And that's my I stream now. I just overload this. So now I can actually do this. See out. Please enter an integer. Now I can say C in into I. Then I can say the number you entered is i. And as you see, that integer is not actually an integer. It's the class I created. But it acts exactly like a regular integer. Why? Are you crazy? We already had an integer. Why are you just creating something that you already created? The difference is that now I can tap into the behavior of integer. I can hack it. Like then, if I wanted to do something with an integer, like define a, I don't know, a student number, and set that student number to have a maximum and minimum value, I had no choice but I had my dirty logic in my main, writing an ugly loop halfway through my logic just because I want to get a student number. In here, I can simply add two attributes, min and max. And in my constructor, I set it. Make sure when I'm reading inside my read function, it actually enforces the minimum and maximum. And then in my code, everything works perfectly. So I can actually hack how integer works. I can hack the language. Hacking is not just finding somebody's password, <laughs> OK? 
in all open source, we call actually changing code hacking. Everybody does that. When there is an issue, you hack Chrome and you add a patch and Chrome's bug is away, you, you fix it and Chrome becomes a better browser every day. All the Linux operating system is like this. So remember, this is, the, the, like the beauty of this is that you can make things of your own in the language, it works the same way. So now if I want to actually do the, so you see how I did it over here, right? Now I'm gonna actually go and apply this to that string of mine. So I'm gonna bring the string .cpp and the string .header file. Split the window and start coding. So uh, can I remove that add to? It's ugly sitting over there. It's like, ah. Okay, I want to take that friend thingy out over there. I don't want to look at it. Okay, it's a bad thing. I don't want it. Okay, so add to is gonna go away. We know what. Uh, uh, we know what. Uh, Helper, helper operators are, so that's uh, what we are having. So let me t remove the add to in here. Where is the add to? So we don't need add to. Um, okay, now let me do the print. So again, it's universal. I simply say O stream, reference, print. Oh, I already had a print, right? Let me fix that print. So that, that print that I have written like that, I'm going to say actually, I'm going to say actually O stream reference, but O stream is in IO stream, right? So I have to include it. IO stream, but be aware you are not allowed to use using namespace in a header file. That's a huge no no. You cannot say using namespace STD and add it. You have to qualify individual objects. So in here, I have to say STD scope resolution, and then STD O stream reference, uh, O stream reference, and that's right operand, and it's set to defaulted to STD C out, and it's const. So that's it. Now I implement that. right over here so so it's going to be the strings print now string print and instead of saying C out all I need to do over here why is it giving me an error oh because I have that I don't need to have it and I have a semicolon I don't need to have it there we go so now in here, instead of C out, I'm going to use, uh, what did I do? Yeah. So in here, I'm going to use, uh, let, let's call it OSTR. OSTR. So it's OSTR that is printed, printing it, and I'm going to return it. Return OSTR. And now, I can actually create the uh, operator signature. At left side, it receives an O stream. And at right side, it receives uh, the string as right operand. It is an STD. I have to mention over here STD because it's in a header file. And why it's, oh. Um, and it has to be in the namespace, so I'm going to take it out, X. It's going to be in my namespace. My apologies, I put it at the wrong place. And there you go. That's my operator overload. I'm going to copy it and put it right over here at the bottom. Oh, I already have it. Oh, it's already done over here. So all I need to do is to call the, the, the print properly. So that's right operand. And in here, instead of saying, OS, I'm going to say return ro.print, and I'm going to pass o OS to it, and we're done. So now my string can get printed using 
C out perfectly. If I want to do it with C in, the process is exactly the same, but with C in is a little more difficult. You'll see it. The read is a little more difficult. Read, uh, it's I stream. And then I string again, I string again, I string, set to C in by default, and it is not a constant. Okay, so, oh, that's also, it's I string. So that's the signature of my function. Okay, now let's write the read function. Read function is not as easy, so pay attention. It's a member of string. Okay. If I want to read from the string, how I want the string to be read? I want to accept backslash n. I want to accept new line, or I want to I want to ex uh, accept uh, space as data, or I want to stop at space. If I want to accept it as data, because you know when you see in a string. When it's space, it stops, right? I don't want that. I want when people enter a space, I want it to accept it. So let's do that. So in here, instead of reading like that, first of all, I cannot read into m value in here. I cannot read into m data in here because m data is dynamic. I don't know how long it is. So I have to get this big temporary character string. I don't think anybody's going to enter more than 20,000, uh, sorry, 2,000 characters, right? So in here, I'm going to say character camp 2,000. Okay? So that's 2,002K uh, bytes of data that I put over there in that one. Now I want to read it using, oh, uh, the default value over here is not supposed to be. So I want to get it using C in, but I want to accept but I want to accept uh, new line. Uh, I want to accept space as data. I don't want it to be my delimiter. So I use the function get line. Get line works like this. It's, it, it's a member of I stream, so I'll go ISTR dot get line. And in here I'm gonna say put it in temp. The count is 2048. And I want you to stop at backslash n. Okay? As simple as that. So now it reads it. Now, I, now in here I'm going to check. If ISDR fails, it means they entered more than 20,000, 2,000 characters. The heck with it. I don't want anything more than that. I want to delete the rest of it. So I'm just going to wipe the rest off. I'm going to flush it. Okay, how do I flush it? I'm going to say ISDR dot ignore 10,000 characters or new line, whichever comes first. So that's flush keyboard. But I can't do it. If it fails, first I have to say I acknowledge that you failed. So C in, as we mentioned before, is a very shy object. If it fails, you have to acknowledge and apologize. Sorry, I know we did a stupid thing. Please, my apologies. Nothing between us. Let's clear our uh, bad things so we clear everything. Then we say ignore everything right down to backslash n. If it doesn't fail, it means it read everything and life is beautiful. And now after that, I'm going to say now that I have the value in temp, I'm going to say set to temp because I already have the function for it, right? It's going to deallocate the memory, allocate the memory, set the function, set it to the temp value and everything. So it's going to set it. We've already done it. How does set work? Where is set? It's going to free the memory, get the length, allocate the memory, copy everything in here. So life is beautiful. It's going to set everything for me perfectly. Then after the set is done, I'm going to say return the I string. So as you see, I hack into read, and now I can simply say over here with no problem, I can simply say, not in here, this is for the other one. Let me bring the string main, so let me remove this. 
remove, remove, add, existing item, string main. So now in here with peace of mind, I can say C out. If I can type it, of course, please enter your name. Now I can simply say C in into S. Done. And then I say C out. Hello. S. How are you? Oh, I didn't implement C in, did I? I forgot. <laughs> I didn't overload it. Let me overload C in. I forgot to overload it. That's why it's giving me error. So let me copy, paste. That's two seconds. So it's I stream operator right shift and I stream again. ISTR and the string is not constant. Okay? And it works exactly like the other. It's very simple, so I'm going to do it in two seconds. Copy, put it back over here. So essentially, it's working like this. I'm going to simply say return ro.read and pass ISTR. Done. Okay, now. My scene actually has a meaning. Okay, I'm going to say hello S. How are you? Okay, now it's actually going to get the S for me and do whatever is needed and make everything work perfectly. So if I, oh, wrong, wrong button to play. Oh, just a second. Sorry, control F. Five. So enter your name. Now I can actually write over here bar dad. So in Hanbu, and I hit enter, and it's gonna say. So now my string is getting everything perfectly that it's supposed to, and uh, um, uh, I can use it for whatever I want. Now you see this concatenate thingy over here that I have written that concatenates two strings and return one. Change that to another helper function called plus. So so you can actually have, so you can actually have string first name. String last. And after getting first and last, you would be able to do like this, do something like this. And string name. I want you to go home and try to do this. So this works. So we can say name is set to first plus space plus last. Overload the plus operator. You need to do two overloads. One overload accepts a string at left and a constant character pointer at right. The other one accepts a string at left and a string at right. Write those two functions. So this can work. And by the way, all the things that we write over here, there is a reason, that's the reason I give you that utils added to your project. If you want to use any of this code, in, code that you see over here in your anything that I write in your workshops, you're welcome to do so. Just copy the code in utils.h and utils.cpp and use it. Okay? It's your choice. Anyways, take a look at it and please implement this. I'm going to say over here, make this work. Make this work. Did I write the concat over here? Go to definition. Come on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, there we go. So it's written. It's two seconds, guys. Like, literally, I can do it over here in, in, in three minutes. So you, you can do it in two hours. Do it. Okay? Yeah, because you have to think. Just take a look at concat. Concat, just rename it, and you have it, right? Anyways, that's it. Have yourself a beautiful day, and I'll see you soon.